sure has a wobbly leg. <laughs> so for those, that, uh, for those that don't know, this is uh, Brett Hurt of um, former Bizarre, Boy, uh, Bizarre Voice. Yep. So, Thanks. Glad to be here. We're very excited to have you, and uh, obviously our audience here, uh, probably m one of the most exciting guests that we, we have on the, on the program, so thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. Now, and ov obviously we've got lots of people joining us online as well, um, so we're going to do our best because you're a bit of a household name here in Austin, and I, I haven't met one person that I've said that you're speaking who has asked me who's Brett Hurt. So it's, uh, it's great to know, but, but obviously there's a, a large audience uh, visiting us from, from everywhere around the world. We saw people from London, from Australia, and, and that's fantastic as well. Great. So you're, you're best known for what you did at, at Bizarre Voice and the success you had there. And I just, I'd love to know from a, from a business perspective, what you feel that you did differently to a lot of other startups and a, a lot of other businesses that really made the difference between you being successful in what you do and you being another failed startup like, like many out there? Sure. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of factors for that. First of all, the timing for Bizarre Voice was perfect. And you can never know that when you, when you start a business. You just, you just uh, go out there, make your best uh, guess at the thesis, and hopefully you're right. And I remember um, a year after we started, and we were in stealth mode for the first eight months, um, Time Magazine came out with uh, the person of the year, and the person of the year was you, as in user-generated content. And I remember looking at my co-founder, Brant, and just saying, wow, you know, our timing is so lucky. Um, and it really feels you know, very much like luck. And I recently uh, uh, attended TED and, and uh, saw Bill Gross speak um, on what are the factors that make, make startups successful. And he said, out of everything, you know, the 200 plus companies he's backed and been a part of, the, the number one factor is timing. And, and I really agree with that. I mean, the second thing is having a great company culture um, is incredibly important. So making sure that you hire people that are incredibly passionate about the cause, that are self-starters, um, that are incredibly uh, motivated to win, and we had a very unique hiring process for that. If I boil down everything um, culturally and say what was the most important, I would say it's the way we hired. And I wrote about that on my blog. My blog is lucky7.io. And the title of the post is the single most important thing you can do to build a great startup culture. An answer is hiring, and I detail that. Uh, but essentially, we tested people um, on whether or not they were truly passionate. I think there's a lot of romance in business. People can think, hey, it's time to jump into a startup. I'm going to make lots of money. And they leave their traditional careers for the first time and jump in. And then they find out that it's really hard. And it takes an enormous amount of persistence. And they pick up the phone, and nobody salutes them anymore because they're not from Dell or IBM or some company everybody's heard of. Um, I remember when, when we first started, I walked into the vet office to pick up our dog. And, and our vet said, um, I know I shouldn't be asking you this, but on your voicemail, it says you're with Bizarre Boys. And I was curious, what does Bizarre Boys do? And I was feeling in a funny mood, and I said, well, we're a male escort service. And, and I had to grab her, because she's turned white, you know, and I was like, look, we're just a bunch of nerds in, you know, nice office space with air conditioning and free snacks. Um, and then I explained what we did. But, but uh, we had a really special culture at Bizarre Voice. We were rated the number one place to work when we're small, medium, and then large company. And I think that was uh, the most important factor to led, that led to our, our success combined with that timing and, 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 you know, the timing allowed us to have a great go-to-market strategy. Brilliant. I think a lot of people are trying to evaluate that timing element. And a lot of startups think that they have great timing and then find out perhaps that they, that they, that they didn't. So how do people really, as a small business, work out whether it's the right time for their launch and whether they should just push forward full steam ahead or whether they need to do more research before they start? Well, I, I'm a big fan of doing a lot of research before you start. Um, I'm not the proverbial kind of jump off the cliff guy. I just started my sixth business now. Um, and I've always done about six months of research before I've started. Um, so with Data.World, um, you know, my current company, we did about that amount of research to make sure that to the best of our ability that the timing was good, 
Um, hopefully we're right. Um, you, you can never know until you launch and start to grow and hopefully the factors kind of coalesce. It seems like uh, the factors are going to coalesce in a, in a big way. We're kind of stunned at, at some of the announcements that have been made recently. Um, but I would, I would say, you know, plan, 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 talk with everybody you can, don't be super um, confidential about your idea. Now you may say, well, you just talked about stealth mode. Um, yes, publicly, you can be in stealth if you want, um, but that doesn't mean you don't talk with every single person that would have some familiarity with that industry and try to assess whether or not um, your timing is right, and especially if you talk with potential clients. So. Um, I spent a long time with Brant doing that in advance of Bizarre Voice. I spent a long time um, doing that in advance of Core Metrics, which was my previous business that before Bizarre Voice that sold to IBM. Um, and you know, maybe that's why you know the timing seemed seemed better. But to be honest, Core Metrics was a little bit too early, and um, I didn't. Foresee, we started in 99 and everybody knows what happened. I didn't foresee that the whole dot com bust was going to happen. We went from 100 clients down to three as everybody went out of business. Fortunately, we survived. Um, later on, sold for almost 300 million to IBM, but it was, it was a really close call. There were a lot of times where, uh, where we were really worried that we we're going to go out of business, frankly. Um, and, you know, you learn in those moments whether or not you really are an entrepreneur. It's very hard to be an entrepreneur. And, I remember one night falling asleep and I mean, right before I fell asleep, I was talking with my wife and I was like, we have two weeks left of cash. Um, I don't know if we're gonna make payroll. Um, we were very nervous um, and I woke up in the morning and I had a smile on my face and she's like, what are you smiling about? And I said, you know what? I realized that no matter what, I'm in the place that I should be, that I am an entrepreneur and I'll pick myself back up and do it all over again, no matter what happens. And I think that gave me the chutzpah to go in um, to Arthur Patterson's office. He's a co-founder of Excel Partners and convince him to uh, double down on us. And they put $40 million into the company um, right after uh, the dot-com crisis. So that was very unusually large round um, in the face of most companies going out of business. And that led to us eventually becoming a successful company. I like the fact that you shared that things didn't just work out perfectly the entire way through. They I never do. I think when people look at success stories, I mean, as you said, you're sixth business now. So clearly you know what you're doing. And people assume that you just, everything went perfectly from day dot. And you come from very humble beginnings. And also things, as you just said, didn't all work out exactly like you, you set out. I'd love it for you to share a little bit about where you came from and how you got to where you are now. Sure, so, so I was born and raised here in Austin. Uh, my parents were small business owners from the time I was born, but small business owners in the sense that they cared more about the lifestyle. Um, they wanted to have lots of time with their kids, um, with me and, and eventually my sister. And um, they, my dad invented the first halogen fishing light, sold those all over the world. Um, they had furniture stores, they had rent houses eventually, um, and they built up a, a, a decent size small business um, you know, no, nothing, nothing as big as eventually what I built up, and they'd always kind of joke, joke with me and say, well, you got the lesson from us to be an entrepreneur, but you didn't get the lesson from us that it's about the lifestyle, because um, my lifestyle's been much more manic uh, than theirs ever was. I mean, my parents, if they wanted to close down their store, they'd just shut down at four o'clock, and, you know, be, customers would come up and be like, what the heck's going on? This place is supposed to be up until 5.30. Um, so that, that was the way they operated. Um, they were very comfortable in their own skin, knew who they were. Um, I saw them go through a lot of tough times. Um, there were recessions, um, like there always are. You know, nothing ever goes up forever. And, um, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I could see through all that that my parents really knew that they were doing something that they loved. And um, that was the most important lesson that I got from them. I also was super, super lucky that my mom bought me my first computer when I was seven years old. My blog, Lucky7.io, is actually written, written as a tribute to her life. Unfortunately, both my parents had passed. And um, my, uh, my mom you know, learned how to program with me at age seven. She could tell that I was interested. Like when I got my first Pong system, I wanted to take it apart and understand what was going on, how this magical box was working. And she thought that was a little bit weird uh, 
for a kid back then, and, and, and so when computers came out, she allowed me to jump on that, and uh, they thought, her and my grandfather thought it would get me into uh, math, and my first programs did do my math homework, but, uh, but ultimately it got me into bulletin board systems, and then eventually I created one of the first online games in 1990. Um, supposedly that became one of the most popular online games by 1992, and um, that, gave me a great career, but, uh, but that wasn't easy. I don't want to make that sound easy because I was picked on a ton as a kid. Um, growing up here in Texas, I didn't play football. I didn't do any of those things. I spent over 40 hours a week programming from age 7 to 21 um, to the point, like, literally where my third grade teacher um, took my mom aside one, one day and said, I'm really concerned about your son. I think he's going to be hopelessly lost in life. And she was very offended by that. She didn't tell me that until I was an adult. Um, but uh, ultimately, you know, I, I, I knew I was passionate about it. I didn't know it'd lead to a great career. And ultimately, um, thankfully, that became a great career. And the world changed in a way I felt like it was going to. Um, but, you know, it's hard to know that when, when you're a kid getting picked on all the time for programming. So from what I'm hearing, it's you swum against the tide and you worked hard, and now you are where you are today. And I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs really struggle with the, the working hard element, and also feeling like the odd one out. Everyone gets up, goes to work, has the nine to five job, and I, I think Austin's very different in the way that entrepreneurs are really praised here about what they do, but I know in a lot of other places in America and a lot of places in the world, that's not as common. And people assume that if, if you're doing something for yourself, you're the person that got laid off or doesn't have a job right now. Um, do you find that which may be or, true <laughs> which may be true but the a lot of entrepreneurs have have that congruence with what they're doing and to, and to push forward and and you seem to have managed to keep that right through have you got any advice you could give people about I guess what kept you going when everybody else was saying perhaps this isn't the right fit and perhaps you're not doing as well the way the rest of the world works as you should be yeah so uh, and, and and that maybe true comment was I was reading an article recently about Oprah Winfrey getting laid off and that's what birthed her <laughs> entrepreneurial career and and so I, I my dad was completely unemployable I mean he would tell you that if he was here um, there's no way that he could have worked for anybody he had to be an entrepreneur he would have certainly got laid off um, and and so you know along the way um, it's uh, it's incredibly hard um, I I, I ultimately ended up going to business school, and um, I went here to UT Austin undergrad, and then I got into the Warden School, and I really wanted to go to a great school, and um, and I worked like a dog to ultimately get in there, and um, and then when I graduated, uh, I started businesses the whole time I was at Warden, and then when I graduated, I ultimately uh, founded Core Metrics like six months before I graduated. And all my friends went off to Wall Street and to consulting firms and were making lots of money. And um, ultimately, I didn't make a salary at all for the first year. Um, I just, uh, I, I, I made a lot of money while I was in school with my own uh, small businesses, one of them a consulting firm where, where I had a lot of cash coming in. So I took that cash, I took, I took some loans right before I graduated to sustain myself and ultimately started Core Metrics. Um, and trust me, there were lots of times where people are like, you know, loser, 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 loser. Like, you know, you're never gonna make any, any money. And, and um, you know, their, their kind of net worth was going like that. Mine was going like this and kind of negative, but then eventually had this hockey stick and everybody's like, oh, you're a genius. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, but the whole time, just like, wow, you know, this guy's like eating ramen noodle, and like, what did he, why did he even go to Warden? And it was very unusual back then to start a business, believe it or not. So that, you know, ultimately, look, the answer to your question is, you have to be super passionate about what you're doing. If you're super passionate about what you're doing, that'll sustain you through the toughest times, um, you have to be authentic with yourself. You have to be able to look yourself in the mirror, say, I'm, I'm, I'm in the right place. Um, it can be extremely hard, um, but, uh, but, but ultimately, look, if you're in the right place, it doesn't matter if you, if you make a lot of money. It really doesn't. All that matters is that you can look back at the 
at, at the arc of your life when you're older and say, I did what I loved. That's all that matters. Um, if, if you make money along the way, great. You can be philanthropic or you can do things like that. You don't need a lot of money to, to, to ultimately have a decent life. Um, it's about you know, love with your spouse and your kids and, and, um, and love of what you spend the majority of your time doing, which is working. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, or maybe fortunately, we have all these parodies from office space to the office to now Silicon Valley, yeah. which is a really funny one. Um, and, you know, th that, that is, I, th I think, unfortunately, the majority of the working force in America does not really love what they do. That's why these things are so popular. And um, that's, not a, that's not a way, ultimately, in my opinion, to live. You, you need to find what you love. And that could be working for someone, too. Doesn't, I'm not saying entrepreneur is the only way. I don't believe that at all. I think very few people are actually cut out to be entrepreneurs and sustain themselves through the toughest of times. I think that's really valuable. The most important thing in life is to do what you love. And I think that's going to be a consistent message with a lot of the speakers. I know I'm interviewing Scott Finley uh, later on. And I asked him what his goal was. Uh, and it, it's not a financial goal. It's, I love doing this, and I want to see how many of these I can do until it stops becoming fun. And if it stops becoming fun, then I'll stop. And right. it's, this, it's a similar message with every successful entrepreneur. It doesn't come from, I'm going to make lots of money. It's, I want to do what I love. And I think that's so vitally important. Right. I think one of, the, one of the things that I know a lot of small businesses are really trying to work out right now is technology and what technology they have to adapt to. I mean, we've got Twitter, we've just had Periscope come out, everyone's using Square. I just had a um, Rodrigo, our cab driver, on the way in. It was the first time I've ever had a cab driver when I, I offered him money and he said, no, 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 I don't, I don't do money anymore, I use Square. And I, we plugged his Square in and we processed it all there and he couldn't speak highly enough about how great Square was for him and his business. And there's just all these new technologies, salesforce.com, Gmail, and as a business, we, it can be kind of overwhelming. But on top of that, if we don't adapt to these technologies, it, we can potentially miss out. How would you suggest that small business really navigate through the maze of all the technologies out there and work out which ones they should adapt to and really utilize within their business? It's, it's a tough question because you know small business only has so much time to ultimately look for solutions. Uh, but the really exciting thing that's happened is that, you know, you mentioned Salesforce. There's obviously Insightly. That's what we use at data.world. Um, there are lots and lots of these uh, small business solutions that are coming on. Uh, on the drive here, I was just talking with Ross, who's here, um, who's the founder and CEO of a company um, named Comnio. And they, they allow small businesses to respond to reviews um, on Yelp and other places like that. Um, so that they ultimately have a voice and they, they actually do that service for their clients. Um, so these things are popping up all over the place. There's lots and lots of small business solutions that will give you a lot of leverage. Um, the reason that works for the SaaS companies is they're aggregating thousands, tens of thousands of clients and so they can provide those services to you at a much, much lower price point than you can do in-house. Um, so it's worth doing a lot of research. If you find yourself doing something manually or you find yourself wanting to do something like respond to reviews or whatever the case may be, then um, it, it's, it's smart to take some time and go out there and look around for solutions that are specifically targeted towards you. Um, it used to be the case in the first phase of software as a service that it was only targeted to the medium and large companies. That's really dramatically changed in the last two years, where now there's tons of solutions uh, for the small business that, that will give you enormous amounts of leverage. Um, and in my opinion, it's the single best time in the history of the US to launch a small, small business because of that. Like you can, you can have a much greater reach, have much more leverage um, because of these tools and the declining cost of processing power and um, storage and you know, just the, the amazing increase of cloud solutions um, provides the perfect kind of nexus point for us to be able to do things that we used to do very manually uh, with, with, with amazing amounts of leverage at very low cost, which makes it a really, really good time to launch a small business. Brilliant, Brett. I really appreciate you sharing so much information with the listeners, both here and everywhere they're watching on SBF Live. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to finish up, but I'd love it if you just share one last piece of advice to, to somebody that's starting a new business 
And what, what do you think is the most valuable piece of advice you can give them? That's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, we talked about preparing in advance and ultimately trying to make sure the timing was right. That's a really, that's a really important um, lesson. Making sure, absolutely sure, that you've got the right partners. Um, you, you don't have to go it alone. It's a lot more fun if you do it with co-founders. Um, but I would suggest you date a lot um, to make sure that that marriage is going to work out. Um, I hear a lot of horror stories, and I've had my own horror stories too with earlier businesses where I kind of naively didn't do that, um, just assumed it was going to be great, and then it turned out to be a nightmare, um, and ultimately was able to navigate through that and continue on with the businesses. Um, so, you know, that, that's a really, really important one. Um, I was just meeting with someone yesterday who unfortunately had a co-founder fallout, and now she's interviewing with companies like ours and ended up uh, closing down shop. Um, but I don't want to scare you off of co-founders. Again, that can be the most beautiful thing, um, but I would, I would make sure you find people that really compliment you. Um, and I would, spend, I would spend a lot of time just making sure you're actually doing the right thing in terms of go-to-market. Um, that's, that's much more important than seeking investors or, 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 or something like that. You can, you can easily find investors if you've got a big market opportunity and you've got a good go-to-market strategy and you've got a good team. Um, but yeah, so spend time on all that. Great. Brett, thank you so much for joining us and I really appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge with everybody here today. You bet. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Great thank you.